You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Vuelta España in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And still out in Spain, Daniel Freib. Hello, chaps. We're a little bit late. We were uh, mincing around in the podcasting gruppetto, I think, yesterday, weren't we, chaps? Yeah, and it was a bit of a hassle getting off the Aitana mountain. We're now in, into Sunday morning and we've got the final stage later today. But can you give us, please, Lionel, the penultimate tale of the etapa? I certainly can, Rich. Thank you. It was uh, stage 20, as you say. There was plenty of activity. Yeah, it ran from Benidorm to the Alto di Aitana, the final climb of the Vuelta, a very climbing heavy Vuelta. And we were anticipating a bit of a showdown, a big grandstand showdown between Chris Froome and Nairo Quintana. But Froome was unable to shake the Colombian on the final climb despite a strong attack six kilometres from the top. Quintana followed Froome all the way and as they rounded the final bend, the Colombian came round Froome and uh, clinched the Vuelta. Um, nothing is going to unseat him today in Madrid. And Froome very magnanimously applauded his opponent as he crossed the line, which was uh, a nice touch. The stage itself was won by Pierre Latour, a 22-year-old Frenchman with AG2R. And he's riding his first Grand Tour. I think Richard, in the first episode of our Vuelta coverage, uh, tipped Latour as one to watch in the climbs. Uh, so he left it late, but it was an impressive win. Did, did I? I think you did, yeah. You mentioned him, yeah. Uh, anyway, Latour was away with Darwin Atapuma. They'd been members of a 15-man counter-attacking move that got clear 110 kilometres from the finish. Earlier on, they'd been chasing Luis Leon Sanchez and Rudy Mollard, who were up the road ahead of them. But on the final climb, Sanchez dropped Mollard, and then Atapuma, Latour and Matthias Frank, who won the stage on Wednesday, bridged across. Uh, towards the top, Latour and Atapuma went clear together, and then the Colombian attacked 400 metres from the line, but was reeled in and passed by the Frenchman. Further down the mountain, although Froome could not shake Quintana, Esteban Chavez and the Orica Bike Exchange team did manage to unseat Alberto Contador, giving back Chavez the third place overall that he'd lost in the time trial on Friday. Another really impressive coup by the Orica riders. So Quintana will win the Vuelta in Madrid later on today. Uh, He also has the lead in the combined classification, but the two other jerseys changed hands yesterday on the mountain. Fabio Fellini took the green points jersey from Alejandro Valverde, and Omar Frihley of Dimension Data took the King of the Mountains jersey from Kenny Ellison by just one point. Poor old Ellison, he was really aggressive early on in the stage, trying to get the points he needed to hold off Frihley. Um, but Friley did a number on him. There are no climbs on the final stage to Madrid today, so the Dimension Data Rider will win that competition. There we go. Quite a few talking points. I mean, you mentioned Orica and Chavez. We'll get onto that. And also the showdown that never really happened between Quintana and Froome. It reminded me a bit of the 2010 Tour de France and the great anticipated showdown between um, Alberto Contador and Andy Schleck on the Col de Tourmalet, and it, it never really happened. But the other thing, Pierre Latour, if, if I didn't mention him at the start of the... Well, I certainly mentioned him in uh, an episode we did of Kilometre Zero during the Tour de France uh, on French cycling that looked particular at FTJ and uh, AG2R, and he was mentioned in that episode. Also, Francois Thomaso spoke a bit about him during the Vuelta, didn't he, in the episodes that he appeared on with us. I mean, Daniel, you can you can tell us a bit more about him, but it was, it was an amazing finish. I mean, I thought Atapuma had it. I thought Latour misjudged it. He did a lot, um, you know, in the last kilometre, Atapuma jumped him, seemed to have the gap, and I, I just don't know what happened. It was very odd. I mean, Latour has a very ragged style, and, and a, you know, um, but he clawed him back and, and incredibly won the stage. He has a tattoo on his uh, on the inside of his forearm that says "Never Give Up" in English, and that was certainly um, evident in uh, in the finish of the stage. Yeah, um, what I think what actually happened was that Atapuma, poor old Darwin, um, got the got the distances wrong. Um, I think. It, he was told from the team car that, um, or he was almost getting real time commentary from the team car, and they were telling him to launch his sprint, and they'd misjudged it by about two hundred meters, or maybe maybe the feed they had was on delay, or so, well, it would have been the other way around or something. But anyway, um, yeah, poor old Darwin was not very happy with the team car as he came over the line. He, um, I think he thought the finish line was two hundred meters closer than it was. And consequently, it, it looked a bit, it all looked a bit misjudged. 
and he made a bit of a pickle of it. Um, not the first time this year that I've been a, been at a race and a BMC leader has complained about not getting the right information from the team car. I remember Richie Port had a few words to say about that, the, the Dauphiné. Um, yeah, and uh, Latour, um, I mean, I spoke to him at the finish line and the intention was for him to come here and, and target the general classification for the first time really in the major tour. And it was going okay until for Miguel last Sunday where he got caught out like many others and ended up losing over an hour. So, you know, when I said to him yesterday, who did did the stage win kind of open his eyes and about his potential as far as Grand Tours were concerned, he sort of said, well, yeah, but to be honest, it's been pretty disappointing in the sense that um, it's been a, a bit of a wake-up call losing all that time last week. But he's still, he's a very good climber. I mean... I remember the route du Sud a couple of years ago where he was climbing with Alberto Contador and Naira Quintana and he's certainly got a lot of talent. Um, remains to be seen whether whether he's going to be able to develop that and also, well, develop his time trialling as well. In theory, he could be quite a good time trialist as well. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you very much to Eurosport for sponsoring us at this Vuelta a España and throughout the year they've been showing the... Uh, the Vuelta, of course, every day live on Eurosport and still lots of races to come. We'll give you details uh, of those in the next episode of the Cycling Podcast. Um, so the, lots more to talk about. I mean, Latour, you mentioned there before before the little break, Daniel, that Latour uh, was sort of slightly disappointed not to have shown what he could do overall, but he's only 22. So I think to come out of the Vuelta with a stage win, he should be pretty happy with that. But there were lots of other talking points. I mean, let's look at Orica. They, they really sort of... Um, almost uh, reinventing the sport tactically in a way. I mean, the, the things they've been doing, the things they've been trying, um, this this Vuelta have been really interesting to watch. I mean, there are two riders really that deserve special praise for the their rides on Saturday. Damien Housen, uh, who was in the lead group and proved a great help to uh, Esteban Chavez um, once he had got away from the, the, the group. And he, he attacked from a long way out, it was about 45 kilometres to go. But just before Chavez jumped, Jens Kukeler, the rider who won the stage into Bilbao, which was my last stage on the Vuelta, um, you know, he won a bunch sprint there, effectively, like a, a reduced bunch sprint. But there he was on the climb, um, setting up uh, Chavez's attack. And I thought, just this the sense of unity that is around that team and the, the, the fact that they're all committed to, to this, to, to whatever goals they have, is, is very, very impressive to see. And, you know, they're trying things and they're coming off, aren't they? Yeah, I think that's the difference, Rich. I mean, the tactics they're attempting are not necessarily that different from what we've seen teams try and very often fail with before. I mean, we've seen Movistar try pinging guys down the road and then bridging to them and it hasn't worked very often. And it doesn't work very often, but with Oracle at the moment, probably because their captains are riding so well, it, it is tending to work um, but it's the execution is impressive I mean even down to um, Simon Yates yesterday attacking behind Chavez I mean I was standing next to Ivan Basso at the finish and and he said oh did you see what Orica did earlier and I said what do you mean and he said well it was it was really subtle it was really there was real finesse in their tactics and I said well yeah I saw the, the house and go and the bridging move and what do you mean and he said no the Yates the Yates attacks they were a master stroke because they completely disrupted the chase they disrupted Contador's rhythm behind and um, they were absolutely key and maybe decisive in Chavez ultimately taking third place and again it's you know it's not rocket science and and they are small things but um, there is a real momentum in that team at the moment and at the moment there's also real camaraderie still between these guys who could be competing with each other I mean Yates and, and Chavez certainly publicly seem to get on very well. Yesterday at the finish, they were embracing and congratulating each other. And how, how could you not get on with Chavez? Well, yeah, it's interesting, Chavez, because he's an absolute delight to the English-speaking press, certainly, and just thoroughly charming all the time. But you speak to the Colombian press about him, and they, they say that he's a, you know, he's a nice guy, and um, they get a lot of what we get, but they also say that he's slightly more complicated than meets the eye. That um, Not that there's an element of turning it on for the cameras, but... Um, certainly th there's an edge to him um, and they have a slightly different perspective from us. I mean, it was interesting watching the Colombian 
the journalists yesterday and the Colombian TV crews, or a couple of Colombian TV crews, not many journalists at all or TV crews on the Vuelta, but very, very strong presence um, from Colombia, also among the fans, of course, um, and also awful lot of Colombian immigrants in Spain, and they've been very vocal and a big part of this Vuelta. But the, the Colombian... Um, TV crews. I mean, it was it was like too many Christmases come at once because they really, you know, they couldn't quite cope with Atapuma almost winning the stage, Chavez saving third place or getting third place, and then of course Quintana winning. Um, they were flying around all over the place, you know, almost falling into ravines um, as they as they chased after you know one Colombian and then the next. No, it's it's amazing. I mean, two Colombians on the podium and. You know, the, the Simon Yates tactic behind was interesting because I think he got a bit of, he, he certainly spotted a bit of uh, criticism for that on social media and, and responded to it. But I watched the, the Eurosport coverage of it and in, interestingly, Sean Kelly called it exactly right. Sean Kelly, who was the you know, obviously co-commentator with Carton Kirby, he knew exactly what uh, Yates was doing and, and he called it as he saw it, which was interesting, you know, having 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 ridden himself a little bit. Um, and, you know, the Yates could do that because he was still a threat overall to, to one or two riders in that in that top 10. So they couldn't really let him go um, for two reasons. One, because he could move up overall, and two, because he, he might, you know, bridge up to, to Chavez possibly. Um, so they, it was, yeah, a master stroke. Um, and as you say, there's there's a real um, camaraderie in that team. They do seem all prepared to, to work and, and fight for each other. And we've seen... You know, they've, they've won stages with some of these riders as well. So everybody's gone home happy. And the challenge, I suppose, will be how do they sustain that? But I think we, what's interesting, if we look at the, the Vuelta and especially that top four, um, you know, you've got Froome and, and Quintana. There was a battle there for first. And then you've got behind them Contador and Chavez. And really, can, can we say that the difference between those riders has been the teams, that Quintana had the stronger team in Movistar and that Chavez had the stronger team in Orica? I would agree. Um, certainly, I mean, Contador was was pretty sheepish about the strength of his team at the start of the race. I remember way back three weeks ago in Arense, he, he sort of said they'll they'll do their best, but we know we haven't got the strongest team here. And um, yeah, apart from there were flickers from them, you know, they were they were very strong on the data for Miguel, but it's become a bit of a maybe a bit of a disparate bunch as well because they're all heading off in in different directions next year. Contador is going to go to Trek and he's taking his a few guys with him, you know, mechanic and staff more than riders, to be honest. And, um, yeah, they weren't particularly strong. And then Sky, again, did it in patches. And yesterday they had, you know, they supposedly had a plan and um, they talked about having a plan in the morning. And um, talking to their riders after the finish and asking them what was the plan, the plan was just basically to, to make it very hard and try and shell Movistar riders on the climbs. But, you know, that, that looked fairly a fairly basic, straightforward tactic and a fairly unsuccessful one compared to what Orica managed to pull off. But, of course, you know, the, the, the winner or the, the rider, the tactic that has success is always vindicated is always you know the one that you say was right after the event absolutely rich it just occurred to me um on the morning of the stage to four miguel i spoke to neil stevens about orica's um tactics and their kind of gc plan and how they use the other riders supporting chavez and simon yates uh, we didn't play that at the time because obviously there was the the ambush or the fiasco of Four Miguel that day. But um, he shed quite a bit of light on how they were working and what they were trying to improve through this welter looking ahead to um, l next year. Um, so I wondered whether it would be worth playing that now. Let's do that. Let's hear from Neil Stevens. Here he is. And Neil, can you explain from a tactical point of view why you wanted to commit so many resources to moving Simon Yates up overall when you already had Esteban Chavez in a good position? Two is better than one, I think, in any any facet of life. Uh, we had we had uh, Simon there quite well up up the road uh, in, in a good position with the GC. Now he's even better, and and it's not about uh, it's not about Simon uh, Yates. It's not about Stephen Chavez. It's about uh, a Rika bike exchange. Uh, we did really well. It was a bit of a tactical move to try to move both of the boys up, which we did. And um, and who knows if there had been a big blow apart, well they might have even got together. And, uh, and and going ahead to both of them. But, uh, yeah, I think it was a good tactical move by all the boys. They played it out well, and, um, and certainly we benefited, benefited from it. 
How did you come up with it and did it work out exactly as you planned or is there an element of busking it on the road as well? It was all planned. Uh, you could, it's not that difficult to make a plan. But if you don't have commitment, the plan doesn't, is not worth anything. And so the, the, yeah, the, the magic part of the day was not the plan. The magic part of the day was the commitment, the belief and the faith in, in that the boys had in each other. They, they, they knew that they had to be there. They couldn't fail. They, if they failed it, they were failing their teammates. And so I think we should talk about a little bit less about tactics and talk about the commitment from the boys. That, that was the most, most important thing. They threw it out there. They achieved a lot. And, um, yeah, they should be proud of themselves. When it comes to trying to make that kind of move, it seems to be possible in a race like the Vuelta, but we'd never see a move like that work in the Tour de France. Why do you think that is? I can't answer that. Uh, why not? Yeah, if I was uh, in charge of a team in the Tour de France, yeah, I might try it, yeah. You say, you say that, but who would have thought that uh, Chris Froome would have attacked on a descent into a stage finish? Uh, who would have thought that uh, Arika Greenedge was going to send four guys up the road yesterday? It's, uh, again, that's the magic of cycling. It's a, it's a cycling that I loved as a, as a kid. It's something that I... Uh, it, it, it was my passion to watch races like that. And I think yesterday's race, it was really pleasing in that regard. You know, how many people have come and said that was the sort of thing that... That, that drew us to cycling in the, in the beginning and that's something that maybe that uh, more people would like to see in the future. And lastly, when the team was formed, you didn't really have any GC ambitions at all, but in the last couple of years, you've really evolved into a powerhouse team. I mean, it, if all goes well, you could have podium positions in the Giro and the Vuelta, top four in the Tour de France as well. I guess a day like yesterday is also about building confidence, planning for next year, seeing what's possible, what can be done, uh, with a goal to try to win one of these. I think there's a, one word that you might, not, might have made a mistake in there. Evolved is not the word. Evolving is the word. Um, it's all part of a plan. Yeah, we, we, we've, uh, we're you know, we're a, uh, a bunch of guys that do pretty good with the budget we've got. Uh, we've sort of you know, formed ourselves little goals uh, throughout and um, we sort of knew that you know, a couple of years ago we wanted to try to get up and, and get a GC team. We, we're creating, we're forming, you know, we're still learning as a GC team. And so, yeah, like any good team, sure we can enjoy the results we've got now, but let's start thinking about the results we can get in a couple of years' time. Whoever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason... Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. See rafa.cc for more information. Thank you very much to Rafa for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast as they have done since the start of the Tour de France and will do for the rest of this year. We're very grateful to them. We heard just before... The, the break there from Neil Stevens, the director sportif at Orica Bike Exchange, or Orica Bike Edge, as I believe they're known, Lionel. Well, in the interview, I think Neil Stevens called them Orica Green Edge, so he's not only wrong, but out of date. At least I'm just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, um, while we remember, because I don't think you mentioned it at the start, but we should say a word about Jose Joaquin Rojas, JJ Rojas, the movie star rider sort of veteran sprinter type rider who had a terror he was in the break actually and um you know perhaps there to to be of assistance later on in the stage if the stage had panned out differently but he had a terrible crash he he slid um on a sort of very very innocent looking uh, bend in the road went under the the barrier and looked like he'd maybe got away with it because he didn't hit the barrier but horrific injury to his leg he posted pictures on twitter late on saturday night and if you had, you know, if you haven't seen those pictures, then I would advise you not to look them up because they're not very pleasant. And uh, he's broken his leg, basically, hasn't he? Broken the tibia, so a very, very nasty injury, um, and and very sad for him to have to withdraw just a day before Madrid, um, when you know he would have been part of a of a winning team. So that's a very sad end to his Vuelta. A bit like Samuel Sanchez, who didn't start on on Saturday having uh, crashed in the time trial on Friday. And, you know, very sad for him, especially at, at his stage um, of life and in his career. He's 38, I think, Sammy Sanchez. So um, that was a sad end of uh, end to his wealth as well. 
But the main story on Saturday was, of course, uh, the, the, the battle for red, the battle for the red jersey between Quintana and Froome. But it wasn't much of a battle in the end, was it? The race was pretty much done and dusted. Um, Sky, as you mentioned earlier, Daniel, did say that they had a plan, but uh, I think they were realistic as well. Uh, Froome, Froome gave it a go, but really um, it, he would have needed Quintana to suffer a quite dramatic and unexpected collapse, wouldn't he? Yeah, he would. Um, I don't think he risked maybe as much as we thought he might. We we talked the other day about how with with the Palmares that Froome's got, he's in a position where he, he well, he was in a position where he could have risked his second place in the Vuelta. And I think he tried a more conservative tactic than Chavez and Orica Bike Exchange. I mean, that was a high risk tactic that they attempted uh, Chavez could easily have blown up and lost four or five minutes and you know there was Contador breathing down his neck and and other riders as well even Talansky could have could have leapfrogged over him so um you have to applaud Orica bike ex- bike exchange I can't even remember now is this bike exchange yeah um for for that and and they reaped the rewards um Froome yeah I mean he he tried he tried the kind of attack which might have worked if Quintana had been on a bad day, but Quintana really never looked vulnerable in this welter, in the second half of the welter. Um, he was extremely strong. And again, like I said a couple of days ago, he sort of dispelled the doubts which had arisen after his Tour de France ride. And, you know, he's talked on numerous occasions during this welter about his troubles with allergies during the Tour de France and... Um, how that had hampered him and how he was back to this was his real kind of level. This he was showing the kind of rider he really is on this welter and he's gonna be formidable for the next two or three years because his time trialing, while he lost a fair amount of time on Saturday, is competent. Um it's certainly competitive. And he, Froome isn't going anywhere for a while, and I think this is the last time that Froome is gonna to come to a grand tour with this assortment of riders who are are loosely related or loosely kind of connected to him and his his plan for for the season they've all been sort of thrown together and and they've tried to find some sort of cohesion in that team but it's not Chris Froome's group it's not his block it's not um, the team I think he wanted to bring or he would have wanted to bring to a Grand Tour. I think part of the issue there, and, and maybe you'll agree, Lionel, is that they put a very strong team into the Giro, didn't they? And, and a guy like Mikel Nievi, for example, um, who rode the Giro and the Tour, would have been a very strong ally in this Vuelta. And perhaps, I know that they were going for to, to try and win all three Grand Tours this year, but perhaps you know a start would be to try and win two Grand Tours and to really to really focus on trying to win two rather than rather than trying to win three with the resources that they have. Yeah, I mean, they never really had... Uh, Daniel, you talk about Orica Bike Exchange's um, tactical risk-taking, but they have the calibre of rider. I mean, if you've got Simon Yates able to um, make a, a little decoy move, as he did, um, then that's a huge advantage. Sky really haven't got a rider... Um, capable of doing that, um, you know, losing Kwiatkowski was a was a a blow early on. Obviously, that that might have helped um, because he's he's strong and classy, and and on certain days would have been able to ride up in the front group. Koenig's um, strategic advantage of being very highly placed overall evaporated at Fort Miguel, so he was less of a card to play. And then after that, it's not looked like a team that's really been directed either by Froome or by Dario Cioni. You know, it doesn't look like a team that's all together. Um, you know, we've seen several times Movistar all in the same place, whether even when it's just at the start line or at the start of a stage, um, they're all they're all in the right place. Tinkoff making a big point of all massing at the start, particularly on that stage to form a gal. And Sky just kind of freelancing, really, rather than, than sort of coming together as a, as a team. And it's, it's not just about having the firepower. It's about having uh, a, a, a plan that everybody is executing. I mean, David Lopez can be a very... Um, helpful ally in the mountains but it, it just looked like he was riding you know a sort of a, a fairly random grand tour rather than as part of a 
a clearly defined plan. And, and while we didn't we didn't need to see Sky all at the front doing the Movistar job because they didn't have the jersey to defend, um, we didn't really see them. Uh, you know, it certainly wasn't the sort of Tour de France A team that would be able to sort of st- um, strangle the life out of their opponents. No, Lionel, you, you talk about Lopez. Um, I actually think he's come out of the Vuelta with quite a bit of credit. He's also come out of the Vuelta with a two-year contract renewal. Um, I remember Brailsford back in May at the Giro was pretty undecided about whether he was going to offer Lopez or whether they were going to come to an agreement about Lopez's contract. And he, he has... He has got a contract renewal, so um, that suggests they're fairly satisfied with what he's done at the Vuelta. But they, they've also been pretty unlucky with injuries. Um, Kvyatkovsky obviously missed well most of this Vuelta with an injury. Um, Kenyuk had problems. But also just looking at the squad, in Chelsea would have been a, a, a big player, you would think, for Sky this year. And he's had a virus that's pretty much wiped out his season. Lander has been unlucky with injuries. And so a lot of the sort of climbing engine room has been wiped out guys with grand tour experience um certainly as far as this welter is concerned you can imagine all of those guys might have played a key role in the welter in another year and that's the part of the team that i think they might have to replenish a little bit in the um in the off season particularly with guys like koenig leaving um you know i mentioned jonathan castroviejo i think they, they might be interested in him but they probably do need, certainly if they're going to, if Froome's going to go and try and win the Vuelta again, they need more of those strong, experienced, all-rounders. Um, the kind of guy that we've we've seen Quintana benefit from. Although, we're, you know, we're having we, we're having the opposite discussion to the one we had at the Tour, where, where Sky were so strong that, you know, it led to calls for reduced numbers in, in the teams. And, you know, here and Movistar were very, very disappointing at the Tour. And they've been very impressive here. So, you know, it's just that it's personnel, isn't it? But, you know, as you say, Sky, uh, there's a couple of riders in Chelsea. He's a gondular fever. A few people were asking about him. You know, he's he was a Giro stage winner last year, sort of guy who would have been extremely useful in a race like this. Um, and they have been unlucky. I mean, Landa as well. They've certainly not, not had the best of Landa. So I'm not sure if they need to replenish. If those guys come back fit next year, that could answer the question. That's true, Rich, but um, you think about Chris Froome, you think about the team he has brought here, but also just his wider kind of entourage. I mean, I'm struggling to remember a very strong Grand Tour, multiple Grand Tour winner over the last 15, 20 years who hasn't had a more clearly defined block of personnel. Uh, and that, you know, that applies to domestiques. And so whether they've done the, whether it's been the Tour or the Welter or the Giro for a particular star, they've always had an inner circle um, that's gone that's gone everywhere. And and Froome, you know, Froome, apart from, you know, maybe his mechanic, Gary Blair, even down to the director sportive, Dario choni has been here and usually it's been Nicolas Portal who's who's overseen all of Froome's Tour de France victories, actually. So that's, that's curious. And I think that that's something that Froome um, might be, it might have given him food for thought, I think, this well. So that's... So it's true, yeah, because you talk about Alberto Contador, you know, he'll go to to trek with a huge entourage. I mean, Basso, Stephen de Jong, I think, are, are going there, as well as riders, backroom staff. You know, look at Peter Sagan going to Bora with with a bit of an entourage as well. That tends to be what happens. It's not just Grand Tour winners. It's, it's the stars tend to have the, the inner circle of Froome move teams. You know, he would probably take Gary Blem with him and maybe a, a couple of other backroom staff, but I can't think of any riders that he would take with him. Um, on trek, by the way, I, I caught a plane with uh, Luca Guercellina uh, from Bilbao to Milan, uh, an easy jet flight, and uh, I was sitting just behind him, and he's a general manager at Trek Segafredo, and mid-flight, the plane uh, dropped, basically, and rocked to the side. A, a flight attendant was thrown into uh, um, a row of people. There were screams, there was genuine panic, and Guercellina was just completely unruffled. Didn't didn't flinch. Very impressive, I thought. <laughs> what did you do, Rich? I screamed. Did you? Did you? <laughs> oh, it was it was terrifying. Had you spilled your gin and tonic? It was the most scary experience <laughs> I've ever had in a flight. Oh. It was awful. But he was completely unruffled. And I spoke to him as we got off the the plane. He didn't even seem to have registered it, to be honest. But um, yeah, he talked about you know how they're building an extremely strong team for next year they've got John Degenkolb as well of course but they're signing up a lot of strong riders from 
you know, like I am cycling and, and one or two teams that are folding and uh, they, they will be a very strong outfit next year. Let's hear from somebody who will in Madrid finish his 48th consecutive Grand Tour. Not quite that many, Rich. No, it's, this is his 16th consecutive Grand Tour. It's Adam Hampton. Where did you get that from? That was a, it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that would make him quite a lot older than... Uh, that's 16 years worth, isn't it? Oh, no, hang on. Mm. He's, going, he's going for 22, isn't he? I think so. Well, yeah, to, at the end, I ask him whether it's on the, on the plan for 2017 as well. Um, we'll hear from him uh, just now. But yeah, he's... Adam Hansen's quite extraordinary, really. That he, He's very laid back. He clearly has a temperament for Grand Tour... Uh, racing. He rode the 2011 Vuelta and since then he has started and finished all three Grand Tours every year. So that's a, a run of 16 in a row. Uh, it's 336 days of racing if you add it all together. So, um, if, And if you stretch that from the start of the year, January the 1st, it runs all the way to early December, I think it is. Um, I mean, it's quite, a, quite an impressive run considering he's had a couple of um, Grand Tours where he's, he's crashed or um, been under the weather um, and, and perhaps had he not got this run going might have um, called it a day but uh, a model of consistency so this is Adam Hansen who when he rides into Madrid and crosses the line on Sunday evening will complete his 16th Grand Tour in a row Good morning Adam I guess we can say you're the authority on the Grand Tours having ridden so many of them consecutively but this year which has been your favourite of the three I know the Vuelta's not quite over but which has been the most enjoyable for you uh, probably the uh, Giro this year I think it's um, the nicest one the Tour is very stressful this one's um, been rather difficult so yeah definitely the Giro this, for this year and they've all got very different characters have they can you describe the differences between the Vuelta and the other two the Vuelta's normally um, very relaxed, late starts. You get to sleep in as long as you want. So it's a lot of free time in the mornings, which is good, and it's low-key, and the mountains are more towards the end, so it's, uh, the racing's a bit easier. The Giro is probably the hardest one to finish. It's very difficult. It's, uh, the profile of the mountains is extremely hard, long stages, the weather can be bad, things like this. Um, and the Tour is um, super fast, super stressful, lots of pressure, huge crowds full media, no spare time, and it's just full on from start to finish. It's been very hot, this welter, and the racing has been intense. Does that suit you? Yeah, I like the, I like the heat. It's just been good. Coming to the third week now, so I'm a bit better than my first two weeks. So, yeah, it just normally does suit me a bit better. And what is it about this streak? It stretched to five years now. I think it began with the 2011 Vuelta and you've ridden every day of every Grand Tour since. Why did it suit you to do the Grand Tours more than perhaps weeks, long stage races and one day races and the other things that are on at this time of year? Well, like three weeks away and three weeks of um, continuous racing and it's, it's nice. It's, uh, you, know, you have a lot of opportunities here uh, in comparison to single day races or one week races and there's always a chance so... The three-week races, uh, I think, are better suited to me. Uh, I think my level of fitness is better for it. And I enjoy it. I enjoy the three countries. And what about your role in the team? Does that change between the different races? Oh, for sure. The role changes quite a lot in the team. At the Tour, it's, uh, it's all for Andre and all for the team. In the Giro, I have a bit of a free card, but Andre came this year, so it's more for Andre also. And then, um, yeah, here, it's a bit of a, more of a free role also. So, it's, you know, it's, they're all different which is good, and um, I have my space in everyone. Are you continuing with Lotto Sudal next year? And if so, have you already talked to them about whether you want to do all three Grand Tours again in 2017? Yes, I will continue with them, and um, I will do all three again. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks very much. Thank you. The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. OK, so we heard there from Adam Hansen. Uh, let's just play uh, one other interview because he was in the break again on Saturday, uh, Lillian Kamajan, a guy who won a stage, I think it was stage four, wasn't it, right at the beginning of the Vuelta, who it seems so long ago now that it's almost remarkable that he's still there in the race. And he did tell me when I spoke to him that his ambition was to try and win another stage. So he, he was in the break on Saturday. But most of all, I was keen to clear up uh, something that some of our listeners brought up, which was that he spent some time in Nottingham at university there. So at the start one morning, while I was on the Vuelta, I spoke to the direct energy rider, Lillian Kalmajan. Here he is. Lillian, it must seem a, a while now since your, your stage win, but have you had a, a lot of time to 
reflect on that? Yeah, it's a, a wonderful stage. It's a win, win a stage in the Vuelta. It, it was sort of something that I doesn't expect at the beginning, but in my in my dream maybe maybe yes. But uh, it was the objective. But win a stage, it's something special for our first year as a pro. Does it make you uh, rethink? You know what what you might be capable of? Yeah, I, since the beginning of the year, I do some good results. I show that. I had uh, I had the level on World Tour, for example, Parinis. I uh, was in good shape, but uh, yeah, it, it's hard to say at uh, also in the team and to be uh, confident to say uh, I, I will win a stage in Vuelta. But uh, you have to to believe in you. It's it's very important in in this in the sport to to improve uh, each year. Now you speak very good English, and we understand that you spent some time in, in Nottingham studying. Yeah, I, I did a, a business school after my uh, my bac in French, it's a baccalaureate, and then I I spent three months and a half in Nottingham in an internship, and uh, yeah, it was very good experience. I, uh, I bring my back to not uh, lose the level, and uh, I did some some good trainings there. Uh, I did also lots of meeting uh, with people uh, who is very interesting. When I was there, I I was living uh, with five people in a, in a house. It was colocation and it was a very good experience with Italian, Spanish, and to learn English. It was very very good and easier for me because you know you have the the difference of accent with a foreigner and a, a pure English. But yeah, it was a, definitely a good experience. A few of our listeners to the cycling podcast remember you also racing some of the 10 mile time trials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at the beginning, I, uh, I did just training and I was looking for competition because I'm a competitor. So I, I was uh, checking on forum and some and, uh, information to, to do race. And I saw that in uh, Nottingham there were uh, lots of meetings like this 10, 10 miles time trial. I don't add my uh, my time to our bike there, but I, I I did some good results and I I remember that uh, people were surprised by my result and it, it was a uh, it was yeah. I think you're the only Vuelta stage winner to come from the Nottingham Clarion 10 mile time trial. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe <laughs> I I don't know, but it's uh, I think uh, in France we don't we don't have this uh, this kind of event. We have Cyclo Sportive, we have event for for rider, but. I think that French uh, will be will be inspired by English. It will be a good idea because uh, Frenchmen are not so good in time trial. In time trial, it's very good discipline. The track also, and because English in track, uh, you know that it's uh, the, the best uh, nation. So I I hope that in the future uh, this kind of event in France could be possible. So that was Lillian Carmejan uh, raving about the British time trial scene and his time in Nottingham. And uh, another, you know, we had a French, a young French winner on Saturday, but he's another another good prospect for France. So listen, um, I think we should wrap things up there, chaps. You've got to get to Madrid still, haven't you, Daniel? Yeah, very much so. Well, you get to Madrid and uh, we'll reconvene again later to discuss tonight's stage in our final Vuelta podcast. In the meantime, thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Napalm. <laughs>